Tis written in scriptures by prophets of old, there'll be rumours of war till the end of the world. And up to the present, how true this has been of the strifes we have heard of and the wars we have seen. And so it was in 1938, rumours and more rumours, war was bound to come. But even more important in the minds of local farmers was the question, will the tanks come or will they not? In 1939, we had six months notice to quit the farm. The family were fortunate to have the offer of a tenancy of East Oregon. Six weeks we had. We were told to leave everything as it stood. You know, in the house and, uh, and the buildings, everything. So they thought Crickmail was safe and carried on farming and then it appeared that zero hour had arrived and we had not completely moved out. Colonel Skinner in his wisdom, or lack of it, had ordered two lorries and crews to go to the farm, clear the house and furniture. They came as far as that. They took 19 acres there and this was the compensation that was, I think, claimed three pounds. That was the old dairy, this is the back of the house. And that was knocked down. Um, by the MOD. I could see it from my bedroom window. The lights from vehicles travelling across the land as well as lights from the tanks firing. My uncle Tom reprimanded the driver with the words behave yourself young fellow or get off my land. The soldier replied get off yourself farmer this is ours now. And so it wasn't an easy time and it was war time as you all know. These inhabitants and their ancestors had farmed this land peacefully for hundreds of years, witnessing many historic dramas. It is ironic that having farmed and survived these foreign incursions, it was to the British Army that they were finally forced to succumb. In terms of the creation of the vast Stackpool estate, the origins go back to the presumed Norman fortified house of Elidor de Stackpool. Through marriage, his estate passed to the Vernons of Haddon Hall in Derbyshire. The Vernon successor, Sir Thomas Stanley, leased Stackpool to his agent, George Lort, in 1578. Now Lort was a canny and shrewd character and he set about accumulating lands in the surrounding parishes before purchasing Stackpool itself in 1611. The eventual heiress of the Lords, Elizabeth Lord, who inherited in 1698, had married Sir Alexander Campbell of Cawdor, and the Campbells made Stackpool their permanent home in the early 18th century, firstly building a fashionable Palladian house and then creating the famous grounds with their lakes. Much later, it was the Victorian Lord Calder who set about improving many of the estate farms and cottages, many of which remain intact today. But the demolition of Stackpool Court in 1963 perhaps was one of the saddest cases in the whole of Wales. My father, Tom Thomas, was a tenant of the Hagar family at a neighbouring farm, Ermigate. Tom and Elsie married and my father took over the tenancy of Flimson in the early 20s. My sister and three brothers were born at Ermigate, but I was born at Flimson. I started uh, at this level with James Roach, who was born in 1779 in Cosheston, Farm, Lower, Lower Nash. He married an uh, Elizabeth Parcell, and you'll find these names appear right throughout the tree, which is a very large tree. Um, and they moved here to Penny Holt, which was then called Linney Row, actually, in 1802. And the last descendants were ended up at uh, Longstone Farm, although they had farmed very many farms on the estate in the area, Warren, Longstone, Trenorgan, um, Linney, of course. Uh, but this was the last farm to be taken from the family 
1939. Although others had left Penny Hill, I think 1934, when their descendants died off and or moved away, and Linney as well. So it's a long time. Limson was 487 acres of usable land and over 500 acres, including the roof, rough pastures. This was 20 acres of corn, 200 breeding ewes and crops of turnips, mangles, sugar beet, kale, and later early potatoes. I went to boarding school. I started at boarding school. I never went to Huntleton. My two brothers, they went to Huntleton. They were older than me. I was five. I and my brothers assisted Warren School and Sunday School at Warren Church. I used to cycle to school, but my brother George was not able to ride a bicycle, so he rode a pony called Peggy to school. And I had to lead him behind my bike. Mary and Mary and Farm, my first work. Mm -hmm. When I was, I went there when I, as soon as I finished school. I was born in Court Farm, Castle Martin, in 1939. My family had farmed there for a couple of generations. I lived with my mother and father and sister. It was 240 acres of mixed farming, cows, sheep, poultry and horses to help on the farm, plus corn, potatoes and sugar beet. Trenorgan consisted of Trenorgan and Ansey Downs and that um, there was an old, as I say, a farmhouse with the uh, steps outside going to the first floor. When we went round they said, oh this is South Row, but it's yes, not. Yes, that's what I know it as, South Row. It's not Road. South Row, it's Ansey Down. This was basically what was on Trenorgan and the uh, sort of the stocking and the cropping. So mixed farming, four bedrooms and bathroom, cattle shed, stables, and a large duck pond. Yeah. All the all the farms had duck ponds. There was one at Haston, Shenorgan, Longstone, and they all had ponds. Yeah. The horses were going well when they turned the horses out into the field after a day's work, they would go, uh, go straight to the pond and they would stamp and thing in the pond and then off to the field. So the, I presume there was your parents and the three of you yeah. grew yeah. up at Trenorgan? That was taken on the lawn in the Trenorgan. And that part there with the chip, I think there's a chimney there, mm -hmm. that was knocked down um, by the um, MOD right. and in the, in there were bread ovens and um, big uh, boilers and it was what we call the back kitchen and this is where the, the milk was separated when they were making butter and it's a shame that it was a beautiful bread oven. Quick mm. There was an old steam engine. Is that what the big chimney was yeah. for? Yeah, there, there was a, a steam engine in there. I remember that. This was quite a big house. Well, it was a three-storey house and a, a, quite a big house, very high house. And I was born there, of course, in, in one of the bedrooms. And uh, it, it had fond memories because people used to come and camp at uh, Cripmail. And then, of course, this all happened. And Yes, I worked on the farm, I can remember harrowing a field of corn. I was a lemon with the old horse and diamond and tom and a lemon acre field. I remember harrowing it in after it was sown. We were growing early potatoes at that stage and Dad would have a telegram from Stackpole from um, Richard England's in Cardiff uh, to dig potatoes we had a few women out of the village and they'd be picking potatoes and then they would be taken by a lorry to Pembroke and put on the train. They made their own butter about anything from 80 to 100 pounds a week. Uh, some of the eggs, butter, and I don't know, uh, anything else, potatoes, I suppose. Anything was, uh, they went to my market every Thursday. So you had 20 cows, 
for butter. And I can remember going around with my parents in Penar, Pembroke Rock, and my mother going into this house with uh, butter for these people, and they came back and they said, well, they didn't want any butter this week. They could buy it cheaper at um, the Maypole, uh, New Zealand butter. Then we rear, were rearing calves and well, off the off the cows, but we stopped making butter. Three to four hundred sheep. sheep. Yeah. Wow, that's Breeding a good number of sheep. Then. Yes. <gasps> Two hundred laying hens. Free range. No foxes. No, not a fox. Not a fox on that estate because of the gamekeepers. So five working horses, horses and two hunters. hunters. My grandfather was a very keen right. horseman. Right. So in 1940, had two men and one girl helping on the farm and casual labour for harvest and potato picking and four soldiers from Norway. Yeah. That, that summer of 1940, we had these four lads all right from haymaking right through to harvest. I used to lead the horse at Marion Farm and... Uh, Warren Farm, when we lived at Warren, when they were making hayricks, like you see the big hot, tall pole and a jib on it, and they used to lead the horse to pull the grabbler up onto the rick all day. No, if you had, if you had a couple of shillings, you was well off. You was well off. Oh yes, this is quite interesting, you see. Uh, as you know, the tankerine is on the limestone. Yeah. There was no water on those farms. All the water that came there was piped. Right. Apart from the ponds and rainwater. Mm -hmm. And up on what we call the downs, there were dew ponds. And these were depressions that very early farmers had made, lined it with clay, and the rain would collect, mm -hmm. and they were known as dew ponds. A horse had a drink in the pond before. He gone on to on his journey when Bill fell fell off the horse, head first into the pond. And my mother said his teeth were green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had to they had to cut all this corn, you see. You imagine a hundred and fifty acres had to be cut with a reaper and binder, you know, and sheaves and stucks and yeah, I can remember those. Horses were used to pull the machinery and it would take the horses two weeks to plough 40 acres. The horses would be changed at lunchtime. The farm labourers used to sleep above the horses in the barn. There were 26 working horses, plus yearlings and goats. A travelling stallion called on Wednesdays at certain times of the year. In 1935 we had an orange and tractor a steam engine and thrash machine owned by Jim Prout and Harry Harris as his helper did the thrashing of corn. If the weather was good, it would be working for several days twice a year. If the weather was poor, it was a long job. You know, the place was crawling with rabbits. The cornfields up near the coast, we had to plough a single furrow round the edge of the cornfield all the way and put wire netting down and and um, bring it through to stop the rabbits from coming in. And her father used to be a rabbit trapper. And he and Will Rogers, they were in partners, they used to be rabbit trappers on the estate. So your dad caught rabbits for a living? Caught you? rabbits all, all, all his life until the, the myxomatosis come. You know Kilfason? Yeah. They were there. Yeah, uh, hundreds. I would think he used to average between 50 and 100 rabbits a day. Georgie Bobo <laughs> collected them every day. He took them to Pembroke and they went uh, off by rail. My dad used to catch rabbits to sell and between 13th of October 1942 and 19th of January 43, he caught 476 rabbits and sold them for 36 pounds, six shillings and 10 pence. Some farmers needed to sell rabbits to help pay the rent. A parcel in Pembroke used to be a rabbit um, uh, dealer and there was a rabbit factory in Pembroke at one time. 
and they were skinning the rabbits, obviously selling the meat and uh, curing the pelt. I've heard from a few people that there used to be open days at Stack Rocks. This was usually on August bank holiday. Not sure about it, but I think it was. My father put up wire netting around the edge of the cliffs to keep children safe. A marquee was put up for tea and refreshments. There were competitions like the sack bag racing, long jump, there was a fancy dress competition, tightrope walking, toss the sheaf and shearing a sheep. The price for shearing a sheep was a watch. Oh yeah, I've been up to the sports day up there, stack rocks a couple of times and uh, little sh farmer's show like you, you, you know my father used to uh, shear sheep in the competition there I can remember that well and but he never never had first prize he always had second that would be in the 30s then sometime in the 30s that would be 35 I would think something like that a hiring fair in the main street of Pembroke that was a big event our big Day was fair day. I always liked the fair in Pembroke. If you had a half a crown to go there, it, you, you was well off. October the 10th, walking to Pembroke then, when I was big enough to walk in, I'd walk into Pembroke to the fair and walk home. On weekends, days, holidays, nice, if you had nice weather, there was a gate across the road near the Coast Guard houses. Well, we used to go up there during the holidays, open the gates for the any cars. There wasn't many, but there was always a, a few. There wouldn't be one penny from one driver. They'd be all thrown. There was a scramble then to find them in the grass. <laughs> 1935, King George V's Jubilee, and Earl Quarter had an open day at Stackpole and all the children on the estate were invited and they stood there dishing out a toy, you know, sort of a fire engine or whatever to all the kids. Uh, and the same thing happened in 1936 when Prince of Wales, yes, he was king and he married Mrs. Simpson. They would shoot a couple of hundred pheasants on to Norgan. Anyway, at the end of the season, the farmers were given two days, but the farmers were only allowed to shoot cockbirds. This was the last two days of the season. Okay. Needless to say, you know, things uh, were not always the rules were obeyed. Um, you know, there were obviously a few hen birds killed. Um, and um, there was one occasion when the policeman from Angle got wind of it and came and you're supposed to have had a game license to shoot and a gun license and there's very few of them had those yeah. and needless to say that the, far the farmers were stuffing their guns into rabbit holes and whatever <laughs> anyway they caught it they caught out quite a number and they were brought to the court and earl quarter was uh, chairman of the magistrates i believe and he was hellish annoyed and um, I'm trying to think of the policeman. Anyway, he was promptly moved. He was sent up to the mountains for <laughs> summer. You know, we were, we were we wandered as children uh, all over the place, except we were banned, uh, forbidden to go anywhere near the the cliffs, the the beach. Very few beaches we went to. We used to go down to fresh water now and again. That's about. That's about the only beach I ever went to. Did you go to the castles? Down over castles and Bullslaughter, which is next to it. That's I've been down there, a timber, mahogany coming in there at one time. There used to be, a, everybody was scrambling for it. I remember going to a horse and trap for picnics at Freshwell West with other families from the area. I also remember going Cockling down at Kilpaston, we used to collect lots of cockles and light a fire to cook and eat some of them before heading home. 
And I think in Jack says he remembers a fellow coming to work there who worked in a brewery. And after that, their mother used to brew about 18 gallon of beer. And at Flimson in the winter, cold, drafty old house, my older brothers used to nip down the cellar, help themselves to some of mother's wine. I think she knew what they were doing, but... Never had a bike until I was working, no. I bought my bike that, I think it was £3.75 or something like that. It was semi-dropped handlebars with white mudguards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always ran round the farms on carol singing, what was that, Christmas well, Day. That yeah. Always went Ermigate. Flimson, Longstone, Trenorgan, Hasten, and back up Merion, Merion Vicarage, and home. That was the, that was the route. We knew our neighbours. We all got on well together. There never seemed to be any thing to not to like about living there. You know. The setting up of the tank range at Castle Martin in 1939 was subject to much national and local politics. The need for a tank range became clear as war loomed and the government had first thought about Castle Martin as early as 1936. By 1938, Castle Martin was on a short list of two sites along with Kirkbean in Scotland. And in February of that year, the War Office informed Lord Cordo of the proposal to acquire 6,000 acres of his land. Inevitably, the proposal went ahead, initially reduced to 3,800 acres, but with the outbreak of war, an extra 1,200 acres was purchased to the west. There were two periods of eviction between September 1939 and September 1940, when some 14 farms and 11 cottages were vacated with episodes of both crassness and great sensitivity recorded by the military occupiers. Rumours and counter-rumours were rife. Local meetings were hurriedly called at Warren School, chaired, I believe, by Mr Campbell Clark, the then agent of the Corder Estate at Stackpole. Many resolutions were made in an attempt to keep the tanks at bay, but all to no avail, like King Canute trying to keep the incoming tide at bay it was a government decision and it was inevitable that they come. The first sign that I remember was civilian surveyors walking the downs in the very early spring. And the most odd lot they looked, walking the ploughed land in what was to us their Sunday suits. And one of them, uh, John Aldridge Roach uh, MC, was a survey auctioneer in the town of Pembroke for many years after the First World War. And he in fact acted on behalf of the Ministry of Defence in acquiring the range from lots of his relations. In that year it was decided by government to acquire the land from Freshwater to West just bypassing Castle Martin village and stopping at Ermaget, as I recall, much to the relief of my Uncle Bert who farmed a crick mail. Uncle Bert's relief was short-lived however as the remainder of what is now the complete tank range was taken over by the military in 1940. My parents of course were devastated when they had to leave they they didn't expect to leave because uh, Crick Mail wasn't on the list of farms that were to be taken in the beginning. So they thought Crick Mail was safe. When they came in in 1939, they took um, 19 acres off the top end of the farm up by Bullslaughter Bay. Yes, this was the, what we called the Long Downs. They, they, in 1939, they came as far as that. And this was the compensation that was, I think, claimed three pounds. Mind you, having said that, you see the rents were very low. The rents for Tenorgan were like about 10 or 12 shillings an acre or something like that. You know, things were making no money at all. Oh, eviction notice. Six weeks we had. I'm sure May said they had six months. Yeah, but they had longer. But they were evicted in 1939. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we had six weeks. We had six months' notice to quit the farm. The 
family were fortunate to have the offer of a tenancy of East Orton, a 270 acre farm. We were told to leave everything as it stood, you know, in the house and, uh, and the buildings, everything. And of course, you see, the people who were evicted in 1939 had a better chance of getting a property locally. However, come they did, and all the farmers had orders to receive the arable land during the spring and summer of 1939. Yeah, like you see, it, 150 acres of corn had to be reseeded, not by a seed drill or even a fiddle drill, but with a bucket of seed sitting round our necks and a good side wind to help scatter it. But in addition, we were expected to move all our equipment and fodder clear of our farms by a certain date in October 1939. It was a tough time, you see. You know, petrol became short and all that kind of thing, which made things very difficult. Heavy lorries had been commandeered for military service, so we had no option but to move our equipment, lock, stock and barrel, by horsepower. I had the job of going to command it with everyone that was calved the whole whole herd. Is that because they didn't have the land? They didn't have the land. Where the camp is now, where all that is, that was their main grazing land for the cows, you see. That field and the opposite one. Town's End was the name of the field where the camp is. So all the animals were walked to we see Arden, our new home from Flimson. Hay, straw, implements, household furniture, goods, one tractor and the horse wagons were all moved for us. On one of these trips, while we were unloading the wagons at West Penner, we heard the sound of lorries coming down the drive. Suddenly we recognised them as army lorries and lo and behold, my Aunt Jenny from Mount Zion was seated up beside the driver. Colonel Skinner ordering two lorries and crews to go to the farm and clear the house of all its furniture. They had arrived at Mount Zion whilst my aunt was preparing our evening meal and started clearing all the furniture out of the house. She nearly had a heart attack, especially when she was bundled into the lorry along with all her belongings. So we said goodbye to Castle Martin Village and to all the good folk who live there. The military established their HQ at Brown Slade, the mansion being the officers' mess and various offices. The permanent staff consisted of a nucleus of tank corps personnel headed by Colonel Skinner. The second in command was a Major Smith. The first I saw of military personnel were little scout cars racing up and down our neat row of cornstalks, and occasionally a more mischievous driver would cleverly knock a few stooks over to the delight of his mates and to the frustration of us who had to rectify the damage. I was travelling towards the end of Mount Zion Lane leading towards Brown Slade when I heard a tremendous roaring noise. That must have been quite something, wasn't it? A, um, an army track crashed over Bulliver Boundary Hedge straight into the road and up over Prickerson Boundary Hedge, leaving a mass of debris in its wake. I don't know who was more frightened, me or the horses. I'd never seen a tank before, and my horses had certainly not. My two leaders had jumped round in the road and stood facing me, trembling and agitated. Nothing was broken, and I went on my way, but it was a long time before my horses forgot the incident, especially the spot where it occurred. The horses, we could hardly work the horses because of the, of the, of the noise. Yeah, of and in many cases, we had to, you know, what we call loose them out and take them back home. They, they would bolt, mm. you know, frightened. Um, and it, it, it was, um, that was quite a, a trying period. The, the same tank driver had previously caused havoc at Bulliber Farm, frightening the light out of a big shire horse who reared madly and narrowly missed injuring his handler. You can imagine they were roaring round the farms and they were still there. Can you imagine that? Pity the army didn't teach manners as part of their training, but maybe that was not a priority during wartime. 
What did they use some of that land for? Well, it was just part of the range at the time. And then one of the one of our colonels they built a golf course there on the field, two fields. So our, our colonel, living locally, suggested to Joe that we turn our, sh his, our sheep onto the golf course. So that's which is what we did. Sometime later, a brigadier visiting said to our colonel, here you've got a golf course, let's go and have a round of golf. So after they'd finished their round, the brigadier said, that's the most sheep shit I've ever seen on a golf course. <laughs> Uh, I won't tell you about one thing that I done. <laughs> Go on. You've got to now, Ben. No, I can't. I can't. I, I had a damn hiding for it. I had my brother's Sten gun. You know, he was in the home guard and he had a Sten gun. Uh, and I said, uh, there was a lot of uh, German planes flying about. And I won't tell you no more. <laughs> yeah. The landing strip. It doesn't show the chapel. Yes, it does. The landing strips were down here. Actually, it's a field outside the chapel gate. They knocked the hedges down. The first year they came was 1936. The grass, this is just a grassy landing area, you know. And the little planes, some of them were Westland Wallace planes, and the others were de Havilland moths. These were used to tow targets for, for the training troops stationed at Manabir camp. There is to Norman, and there was um, a Blenheim bomber crashed in that field there in uh, 1940. Two airmen were killed. It was a Blenheim bomber on um, a training exercise from the Bristol area somewhere, and they got lost and ran out of fuel and the men and haymaking at the time and we saw this plane coming over and it's, it's, it, it's, it just went down and the poor thing, it went into the ground about 50 yards from the, one of these big banks and of course a Blenheim bomber at that time was a very flimsy affair right. and the two men in the front were, you know, they were killed obviously. And then there was a Spitfire crash here again in 1940, that was at uh, Crick Mail. It taxied and it came, it was a lower level, right at the bottom of the field. It didn't crash into it. It sort of went through and then tipped in. So of course the RAF fire brigade, fire engine and the lorries and you can imagine. And the pilot got out sucking his thumb. <laughs> he hurt his thumb. There was another landing strip then for the army in Waterlands, that was uh, up Armigate Road, the third field up. I can remember a good many land in there. Many, many crashes during the war. Spitfire at Tenorgan, one came down there. Avro Hansen at Warren, just at yeah. the top of the hill there. Avro Hansen came down there. Surprising how many planes used to come over here nearly every night, you see. Double talk had a nasty bomb in mind during the war for the size of it, you see. I seen the planes that bombed the tanks. I seen them come in. We were driving corn on the north road on here where you were looking at, at, the, at the tanks. They were di dive bombed. They reckon it was the second biggest fire in Britain during the war. Oh, you you could go outside, yeah, there's nothing stopping you going outside, but you was having oil all the time on you. It was in the air, you see. Oh, there a lot of local interests in the RAF and the de Havilland station by the chapel. And it got around that if there was a bottle of whiskey going, you might be lucky enough to not be asked to take a trip up in the aeroplane. Can you remember where you flew on that first flight? Oh, just just round Longstone and back, mm -hmm. Bull Slaughter back. You see, the, when the Yanks was all, all year, it was wonderful to see them jitterbugging. <laughs> yeah, 
throw in the girls up over the heads. Oh, and the girls loved it. Yeah, of course they did love it. Yeah. There are the F ball in Hanger, either nineteen thirty six or thirty seven. A big event, music, a good band, a bar. Tarpaulins were put on the grass with lots of French chalk to make a good surface for the dancing. A net attached to the roof of the hangar filled with balloons. At the end of the evening, the balloons were floating down over their dancers. I used to visit Brownstead Farm where there would be singers in the loft. I remember one lady who had a very screechy voice. When I was about nine years old, I saw Vera Lynn and Betty Driver performing on Castle Barton Camp for the entertainment of the troops, but the military allowed local people to attend. We used to go down and watch. We'd seen Henry Hall there, the band, uh, Ivy Benson and her girls' band, down in the, in the cinema there, you, you see. You used to have dances, didn't oh, you? Oh, wonderful dances there, yeah. Mm. Used, to go do, used to go down there, play snooker. They had two snooker tables in the top end of the naffy. To be honest, I think it's only one farm was still under the roaches in 1939. The rest, of, that's a Longstone farm. The rest had really petered out on the estate. They'd moved away to other farms. So the, the, the military taking the farm over didn't have a huge effect on the family by then, by 1939, other than, of course, Longstone. So it wasn't a very easy transition. They kept hoping that they could go back somehow. But then, of course, when the house was blown up, that was the end of the whole thing. It had, it had such a lot of memories for them that I think they couldn't quite put it behind them for a long time. What I remember was them being sad when the war was on and they'd always talk about it all, you know. Mm. It, it wasn't that they wanted to leave there because they didn't. That was the last thing they wanted. The army, the WD, caused a lot of unhappiness when we were just had to leave our homes. But after they'd established themselves, they were very good neighbours. We got on well with the army colonels, and if they could help, we would. I give them that. It never affected um, us, I don't think at all, anyway. I, I can't say it did affect me. It, it affected the, uh, the bigger farmers like Warren and Marion because they lost a lot of land. As a matter of fact, it was uh, better. Were they, were they really, you know, upset, disappointed, Well, obviously, annoyed? They, they'd been there for, um, for um, 40 years. Mm. It, was, uh, it was hard, but you never took no notice of it at that time. Never took no notice of it. Mm. Wonderful times. As, you, as the families came, you got to know them. If their children were the same age as our own children, they, their mates would come up then, you know. No, we got on fine.